Um, hi, everyone. Um, I know it's um, afternoon for us, but maybe later at night for some of you. And um, I'm reading some of the countries um, in Europe. There are people coming from Africa, um, coming from Latin America, and also to the US. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Rea. I'm the Associate Director, Senior Associate Director for PK212 at JWell. Um, I'm here to welcome our speaker. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of context about this series of webinars that we're organizing in partnership with Learning at Scale uh, at ACM. So we decided to, um, to organize a, a few uh, webinars to um, talk about research. Um, we know that uh, at some point in April, about 1.7 billion learners um, from K to 12, but also higher education, we're out of school, um, out of their normal places of, um, of education. And we know that many countries, many institutions pivot and offer remote solutions uh, and blended learning solutions. Uh, we're interested in like promoting a conversation about what has happened, what has been done, but also talk about research. Uh, talk about the research that has been done previously because we might be able to to use some of that research, but also promote that we collect data and we use research as we um, continue to create solutions for uh, what is coming uh, in the uh, in the next year. Uh, for us, September at MIT, for many countries, um, you know, uh, maybe later in the year. So this is the second uh, webinar we organize of this series. Um, we have with us today. Uh, professor Pedro Ruiz. Uh, he's the Associate Professor from the Department of Information and Communication Engineering and also the Vice Chancellor for Strategy and Digital University at University of, of Murcia in Spain. Uh, Pedro is here to talk to us about what University of Murcia has done um, and maybe uh, give us some of um, uh, the information about what is planning for, for the future. Um, um, as I said, Pedro uh, is both at uh, the Department of Information and Communication Engineering and Vice Chancellor at the University. He is responsible for digital transformation of the whole institution and leads the IT department. Prior to becoming Vice Chancellor, he was the Dean of Computer Science Faculty at the University of Murcia, has also held a few research positions, including visiting research at um, ICSI at UC Berkeley. Um, he's, um, he was a research associate at the UC Santa Cruz and visiting research fellow at the King College in London. Uh, welcome, Pedro. Uh, very happy to have you with us today. Hi, welcome er everyone. And it's my real pleasure to be here to, uh, this afternoon uh, talking about what we have been doing uh, regarding COVID. So let me please share my screen. Okay, so today I'm going to talk uh, basically about a few things. I will start with a little context about the Spanish university system and University of Murcia in particular. And uh, I will structure my presentation on what we've been doing uh, temporarily. Basically thinking of, about uh, what's been phase one, um, responding to the emergency of uh, promoting remote teaching and, and then phase two which is very, pretty much related to online assessment. Uh, finally I will present some conclusions and probably stimulate some discussion about the uh, near future. So these are some figures representing the University of Murcia. As you know the Spanish university system is uh, especially uh, for public universities is very highly dependent on public funding and uh, this is the reason being basically that uh, learning is pretty much subsidized. Uh, in our case, we are uh, located in a region uh, which, in which the GDP is not uh, uh, among the top of Spain, I would, I would say probably the opposite. We are basically uh, in the lowest part on the uh, regions of Spain regarding GDP. So in that sense, uh, that has an impact regarding uh, our 
context when we have to deal with such situation. This is something we will talk about later uh, when I will talk about the digital divide, which has been something in particular in your region very important to deal with during this uh, COVID. Uh, we are basically, uh, according to the Spanish standards, uh, I would say a mid-sized university. Uh, we, at the moment we have like five different universities, camp university campus, but uh, uh, the biggest of them has around uh, 20,000 students. We have 21 faculties and five affiliated centers. Um, we are teaching basically uh, uh, 51 degrees and 68 master's studies with the additional 36 PhD programs. As you can see, uh, our budget is not very uh, big, and this is something very important when you deal with such a situation, which uh, uh, you have to uh, suddenly react to uh, these unprecedented changes, and uh, of course, if you don't have enough resources, then you have to be very creative on how you manage to continue the teaching and learning activities. Uh, we are uh, about uh, 2,600 2, uh, teaching staff and uh, uh, around 1,200 uh, administration personnel. Uh, regarding students, as I said before, in total we have uh, nearly 32,000 uh, plus additional 22,000 uh, in some other, I would say, non-official studies like extracurricular and uh, requalification uh, studies and things like that. Uh, in that sense, uh, we are a very generalistic university. We, are, uh, we have a multitude of disciplines ranging from liberal arts and uh, economy, business administration, uh, communications, uh, to some other disciplines like bio biology, uh, medicine, uh, nursing, or even uh, computer engineering, right? So, uh, in our situation with this background, uh, I think basically a, the first response that we have to design is basically trying to survive in a situation in which suddenly a, everything changes. In that sense, I think we were kind of lucky because a, before, I would say in Spain, I think there was one single case of COVID by March 4th. A, and I remember having a committee meeting with my IT department and asking them to prepare a, a contingency plan. And the people started laughing, saying, uh, why are you talking? I mean, whatever you think is going to be this thing. I mean, this is not going to be that much. Don't worry. In any case, uh, I insisted and they started working. And in a couple of days, we had the first version dealing on how to continue all the areas in the university, not only teaching and learning. And I remember um, March 9th, just a few days after Monday, I talked to my rector and told him, okay, we have an initial plan in case you want to know. Uh, he said basically the same to me. It's not like, why are, you so, why are you so worried about this? I mean, this is not so big. We have there are two cases here in Spain, don't worry that much. I mean, uh, the reality is that in just a few days, uh, I remember uh, on Tuesday night, he phoned me, he was coming back from a meeting in Cordoba, and he told me, uh, remember that plan that I told you to put just in standby? I think tomorrow we need to start working on that. And in just a matter of three days, we had to put the plan into execution. And we had to, you know, prepare all the tools that we were, uh, that we thought about for continuing teaching and learning. Basically, we had to uh, prepare our new video conferencing system and integrate it in our LMS in a matter of three days. We had three days also for uh, preparing all the guides, guidelines, and tools for teachers. And uh, uh, not only that, having all our personal uh, in teleworking. This, is, this was uh, really a challenge. And uh, uh, in fact, 
uh, the main action lines of our plan had to be executed in a matter of three days because uh, a, it was decreed by the national government that next Monday everyone would be working from home. So we have to activate all of these things. And uh, one of the most important is that at that time we detected, and I think that times uh, 10 after uh, has proved us right, is that uh, the especially it was very important to dimension the uh, support to our users. Uh, we basically uh, moved people that were doing some of the tasks, we give them courses, and we put them to work remotely as a service assistant to all the teachers so that they could actually a, have a direct response when they had any kind of problems when implementing the lecture. So yeah. basically, a, after meeting yeah. with all the different a, centers, a, in this emergency situation, they said that, you know, the they needed was basically a kind of real conferencing, the tools from the LMS that we really had, a, everyone found them quite perfect and actually we didn't receive any ask for any additional tool. People of course uh, realized the importance of recording lectures. The idea of remote virtual desktops, I think this was something that also set, saved our life in the sense that this allowed many of the work that students were doing uh, in lecture rooms with computers, they could be doing them from home. And that was very, very important because otherwise uh, we may be only continuing half of the teaching and, and that proved to be very interesting. Of course, collaboration tools that prove uh, like very, very important. So basically what people like the most is uh, the, uh, all the courses and materials we prepared for uh, teachers and students. So about how, which tools they could use and they could have during the, the lecture, right? Uh, this idea of creating very, very simple to use, uh, that, that was uh, very, very important because a, in particular, our po population of teachers, uh, the mean age is uh, tending to be quite high. And in many cases, they didn't have the, the required competencies and they have to work very hard uh, in order to keep on moving to, uh, to what it was required. In that sense, uh, after integrating all these tools, of course, we realized that uh, the typical use of our tools and what people were doing changed completely. Here is exactly May 16th. Uh, it's the last day before the lockdown. So everyone on Monday, 17th, March, is when everyone started uh, working remotely. And we saw that our LMS starting to experience more than double the typical activity that we were supporting before. And uh, not only that, we saw that even uh, when looking at the specific tools, uh, the activities uh, they change differently depending on the tool. For instance, what we saw is that uh, there was more people downloading resources, and that's fine, but not such a, such as doubling the, the, the effort or doubling the, the capacity. However, the private messaging between teachers and students uh, just went like threefold, and we start seeing a lot of task assignments. And this is something that uh, I'm starting to worry that's a little bit, something like, uh, is it like a people is really changing the model, teaching model, and they are moving to continuous evaluation? Or is it that many people think this is just a couple of weeks of problems and in two weeks we are back and they just decided to assign work for students uh, as a way of waiting to see what happens? So the reality is that uh, when we conducted some initial survey, and basically what we did is, and I think it's very important, this situation is counting on students. And we asked our, a, a council of students to run the survey and a, from the opinions of a, more than 8,000 students, 
what he realized is that he started to see an increase in the workload. Something like, it seems that teachers are asking us to do much more than they, we were doing before. And uh, regarding what uh, teachers were doing, we realized that uh, it was pretty much uh, different on each one. It's not, there, was not, there was not like the, the way of doing that. Of course, but it makes sense. I mean, we didn't have that much time to design a, a methodology or something like that. So everyone started to do what they could, basically based on their competencies, some digital competencies based on their knowledge and, 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 and based also many other factors. But in practice, what we saw is that uh, there was these too many people uh, just interpreting that what they had to do now is as, uh, assigning tasks to students. Uh, of course, there was also a part of uh, professors uh, that moved the traditional lectures to write the conferencing. And there were some others that basically uh, just uploaded new resources or notes and expected students to study, study themselves. Uh, and then give them support through collaboration tools. Uh, so when we analyzed how students rate the whole experience, we see that, okay, this maybe, if we forget about neutral opinions, this is probably a little bit more negative than positive, but you know, it's kind of balanced. And the reason being that I think it, it depended very much uh, on, different professors and what they were doing. So at least this helped us to know, and students complain about that, that there was a few things that we could be doing better. And this is the importance of uh, gathering all data in, uh, to be able to analyze and make informed decisions. Uh, in that regard, uh, I confess I'm a passionate of data. So uh, even though they run the, the, the survey, uh, at the same time, of course, I was like getting and logging information about everything. So they claim that, uh, for instance, that 29.5% uh, of professors were using by the conference and uh, I knew I would actually it was even less, right? And only 42% of students were supposed to be the conference. So during these first two weeks, Basically, what it happened is that I think this first week was basically like everyone trying to design and decide what to do. On the second week, I started to see that uh, people started doing more conferencing, video conferencing, and also a recording of classes. But compared with the number of subjects we had, it, there was not that much. And I think that many people thought that it was just something that in a few weeks would be over, so it didn't make much sense to, to redesign everything. Pedro. Of course, when every, everything continued. Pedro. We, yes? We do have a question, and I, 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 I was doubting whether to interrupt, but it's, it's sort of a relevant question, oh, and I, sure. I would like you to, to maybe consider answering. Um, Julius is asking, how do you ensure that all of the students are fully involved and what in reinforcement do you use to have all of them on board? And since there was such a change from week, one week to the other one, I wonder if you have things to say regarding this uh, question from Julius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, it's, it's important that I think uh, what we got from the opinion of students is that it's important that uh, you try to engage them by doing. I, I think what you cannot do this time is just trying to treat them as a pay passive element. Uh, especially when they are uh, locked down at home and they are uh, distant from you, what you have to do is engage them by doing some activities that they find useful. Uh, first of all, because they may be doing at home any other things, if they don't find things useful, that's difficult and uh, basically make them active learners. I think, of course, that's very difficult. And I think during these first two weeks, these numbers, what they show is that we didn't do that. 
I mean, we didn't manage to fully engage them. Some uh, professors actually uh, were very happy because they thought, I mean, they thought, no, I mean, they, they saw the numbers and they saw that they had more students in the video conference in sessions that they had before in their classroom. But, uh, of course, if you don't make the most of that sessions at the end, they are going to stop joining your video conferencing sessions. So that's the, a very important point. You have to go beyond just video conferencing. But at least at that initial stage, two weeks, two weeks after the lockdown, the students clearly saw that uh, they prefer video conferencing much more than uh, the other alternatives of professors just assigning them tasks. And I think probably that's because maybe the task was not a, uh, very much uh, of interest to them or, or they felt that they were not learning from the task. In that sense, uh, what we saw is basically that after the first couple of weeks, when people realized this is not like a matter of two weeks, this is going to be the whole semester, uh, actually, your professor changed their mind. And we saw that most of them started using much more video conferencing. And this is uh, in the yellow line, you can see what happened uh, uh, by the last week. I mean, in many of the different faculties, for instance, biology, you can see that probably only 10% of professors were using video conferencing for the first two weeks, and they were more than half of them at the end. Uh, and we must take into account that not all professors, I mean, 100% is not realistic because there are some of them that they are not teaching in the second semester, for instance, right? So uh, in some cases, you get very good numbers and there are some other faculties in which they also increase quite a lot. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, there were two different factors in this. First, they realized this was for real, so they had to change. And second, I think students, uh, uh, actually make their, make their, their voice heard and, and that provoke that reaction. And this is something I clearly saw. When I analyze the data for the whole second semester, I can see that uh, we, we were from about 150 sessions of video conference in a day, 200 maybe, to 500 daily and uh, every day. So most of the subjects were actually using the conference. In some cases, they were using, I mean, it's true, they were using them basically as a substitute to their uh, previous lectures or typical lectures. But in some other cases, I remember people doing very, very good job in preparing videos and materials in advance and then using the lectures as a real uh, flip classroom in which you use and make the most of that virtuality. And they were like doing exercises, working on joint projects, things like that. So. Of course, that depended very much on the background of each professor. But we saw that they started uh, recording and having much, many, many, many more uh, conferences. And also the number of students, the mean number of students along the whole semester was more or less stabilized. While usually what we were experiencing is that they decay as the final weeks start uh, uh, being developed. So, in, in that regard, uh, what we saw is basically uh, that uh, there was a need to guarantee that no one gets uh, excluded of this. And in order to, come to uh, uh, you know, detect uh, in advance which students may need help in order to avoid the digital divide, I mean, there was the case that of students who detected that they, were, they had no connectivity. They were confined, confined at home and their parents were living uh, in another region in the, in the countryside, for instance, and they had no good connectivity. We had uh, also students uh, that uh, were isolated without even a laptop in, at home. So what we did basically is uh, we use uh, analytics again to analyze a how changed the use, usage patterns of some of our digital tools, basically the LMS, a webmail, and things like that, before and after the lockdown. And this allows us basically to uh, detect some of students 
that even though they did not report it because they were completely disconnected, were actually suffering from digital divide. And uh, basically to help them, what we did is uh, different agreements, like for instance, all the laptops that we had for lending in our libraries, we started installing and packaging them and send them to wherever they were living. Uh, we also were providing uh, for, uh, 4G SIMs for accessing data through mobile uh, networks. For instance, we made an agreement with Vodafone, which was at that time the provider for the, the university for mobile communications. And basically the agreement was something like that. I mean, uh, all the people in the university, all the teachers that have a corporate line are now at home using Wi-Fi. So they are not consuming their data, we are paying for that. So we want to reuse that data for our students. And they were really, really keen on helping and we started sending things to our students that were in need over there. And in total, we have already uh, distributed more, uh, nearly one, 500 laptops and more than 255 SIMs. Uh, and, it, and, and I think that was very, very important in trying not to make people a, a or not to exclude people due to societal uh, aspects. And in that regard, uh, this is one of the initiatives we are quite happy. Pedro, uh, just, just for reference, so uh, just um, 500 uh, was the total for all of the students because you have, uh, what, uh, 30,000 mm -hmm. or more students? Uh, is, that, um, is that right? I just, I just wanted the reference. You gave mm -hmm. 500 computers to the total population of more than 30,000 students in, on campus. Is that yeah. right? That's right. I mean, our estimation based on the analytical data is that basically 3% of students could be in risk of, risk of, of digital divide. And that will make a total of 900 students, more or less. And when we really started trying to reach them, uh, some of them, I think, at that point were really uh, or found some, kind, some other solutions, probably held by family or some other uh, means. And what we detected that still didn't manage to solve the situation was like these 500 students, uh, actually 500 for laptops, and, but there's some other people that require the connectivity, but they already had a laptop and things like that. So in total, it's not that bad. I think probably uh, we may be reaching I would say 600 more or less because some of them actually require both uh, connectivity and laptop, but um, uh, not far away from our rough estimation when we started with this. Great, thank you for clarifying. So by the end of this first phase, basically what we found is a lot of people with gratitude to the IT people. I mean, this is like, okay, we we had this terrible situation where confined at home and we've managed and doing my teaching and my students are happy and but I at, at this point I realized that we were just starting I mean this was like the sunshine uh, when you are in the middle of the hurricane and this is a picture of Dorian uh, and you say that something worse is coming and of course that something worse is really uh, devaluation so I, at that point, we decided, come on, don't, don't, don't think we have solved anything. I mean, this is just the starting. I'm sure expectation of people is gonna grow because they wanna expect more and more and more. At the starting, when you are not confident, you can continue your teaching. Uh, you are very happy just with uh, a video conferencing. But at the end, students will realize that you, you need to do something more than that. And, in that regard, we started working also very fast on phase two, which is basically how to make the online assessment. At that time, we weren't sure we had to do the assessment, the assessment on, online or not. We, we were not sure at all. But we decided that uh, we had to avoid having to do everything in three days again, because that was like, crazy. Uh, so as soon as we were 
running the plan uh, for continuous teaching that we started with that in March 17th. In already March 18th, we were already designing how to do evaluation in case we had to do it online. And again, we have like three different phases. Design what's gonna be needed, make all the actions so that everything's ready when needed, and then the follow up to make sure that uh, the plan is working or if we need to adjust anything, uh, take care of that. And it was actually a, a real challenge. And I think uh, compared to the other challenge, uh, this is like uh, many times more difficult because uh, we were not prepared, of course, to do digital assessment. Uh, the course was already running, so many of the options that you may have are not there. For instance, the use of proctoring. This is something I will talk a little bit later. Uh, according to European regulations for data protection, at least in the case of the University of Murcia, in the way that students enrolled the course that they are, uh, we, were, we were not able to use many of the tools because uh, uh, we couldn't guarantee an alternative solution to that at, at that time. So that was, that was violating the uh, data protection regulations. So we, what we had over there, we had to take decisions and decide on which systems and what we would do to do the, this uh, online evaluation, right? So uh, initially, we did a lot of effort in analyzing of the different doctoring solutions, and we even uh, had a clear uh, selection of tools that we were about to use and tested them. But uh, as I mentioned, as everything developed, at some point, our data protection officer, and in fact, in, in, in Spain, uh, uh, the conference of rectors, CRUE, uh, also uh, had a very, uh, very good research, uh, 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 research no, sorry, a, ve a very good group of people working on recommendations, and many DP, uh, uh, data protection officers reported that uh, in current system, uh, circumstances, we couldn't uh, recommend the use of proctoring. So, this creates a problem in, okay, how do you guarantee that the process is fair and at the same time uh, you can deal with that? Uh, or option number one was actually a proctoring solution in the cloud and forget about technical, technical problems, but we had to stick to a different solution. And basically, we were using the tools provided by our LMS, in our case, Akai, uh, for running the exams via submitting tasks or either uh, quizzes. And then uh, we basically uh, decided to use Zoom for uh, interaction between teachers, students uh, during the, the exams. And uh, based on that, uh, of course, we realize that again, key to avoid future problems is to prepare your, your students and your teachers for the process. And we prepare a whole website, uh, uh, education portal for them, in which we were using, offering seminars, uh, videos, uh, small lessons, uh, frequently asked questions, documents, very, very a concrete, precise, step-by-step -step information so that they could uh, do with guarantees this uh, process of remote evaluation. Uh, in that regard, I think this is one of the key uh, aspects in which uh, I think we did a, a, a good effort and it really paid, paid off in the sense that uh, I realized if we wouldn't put so much effort on this, we will be now experiencing quite a lot of problems in the, in the process with people, you know, like messing up with the applications and things like that. So it, it was very, very well accepted and uh, acknowledged by all the students and, and professors. We had a lot of visits to all the different videos. We prepared, we prepared like more than 70 videos. We have had uh, 100,000 visualizations. And we did like 26 online webinars. I mean, whenever there were still teachers having doubts on how to do their evaluation, we were running uh, webinars. In some of the cases, uh, or in most of them, uh, we had like 300, 350 professors in, in each of them. 
And uh, uh, based on that, uh, we start to think also on how to do the evaluation itself. I mean, okay, they have to be prepared, but how do we technically uh, afford this? Because we were in this situation in which uh, our LMS was supporting at that time like 262% a more load than ever in the whole 10 years of Sakai in our institution. And in fact, in April 1st, it, 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 it sounds like a joke, but the reality is that we had a new record of 880 requests that day on, on our LMS. And with that, as a starting point, just before starting evaluation, we had to guarantee we, have, we ran a predictive model on how many uh, assessments we were supposed to deliver and how many uh, of them we probably had. And we had to deliver like 119,000 different uh, uh, assessments in a matter or a few weeks. So how can you afford that? The first thing we did is basically improve as much as we can our, our infrastructure. We uh, take advantage of all the different computing uh, laboratories that were not used at that time. They were all virtualized before the lockdown, so we took those resources and we moved them to the LMS. And we basically moved from uh, eight different nodes, which is basically, I know this what I depict here in the pictures, uh, it's basically one a uh, node with two inst instances of a web server. And we moved from eight nodes to more than 15 nodes and increased the capacity by a, a, an important uh, point both in computing and memory. Even with that, we had to increase the disk capacity and move to a, a faster hard disk because we realized there was a bottleneck over there that we would probably cast in the middle of the of exams. And of course, we have to move all the collection of statistics uh, to be performed at night and uh, separate computing more nodes. It was very interesting because I remember I had a strong argument regarding statistics. Because what technicians said is basically, okay, statistics is a very risky, is a very risky element in here. So it's better we turn it off. I said, no way, if you do that, you, are, you have already killed research on this. We need to know what's really happened because we need to learn from that. And I'm sure quite a lot of, of research can be done from all the data we've been collecting because this has been kind of a very historic moment, a very special situation, and it would be a pity we have lost that data. We managed actually uh, to... Uh, continue the process without losing any single piece of data. So based on that, we try to analyze and prepare for the future. And we try to study uh, if we took the exams from previous year, how many concurrent students would be taking an exam at the same time uh, in our LMS this year. And we realized that we may got some peaks or even uh, over eight or nearly 8,000 students in the uh, best, uh, I mean, in the uh, uh, best case estimation, we go to worst case that would be even more than 1,400,000. Uh, so, uh, for, sorry, uh, 1,400. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, we realized that we had to move basically to do a really stress test to our system and basically learn from uh, how to do and run the exams without any major problems. So we put in a replica of the systems to the limit. We realized that we need to try to avoid the concurrent style of exams. For instance, this depends of course on, on each LMS, but uh, from what I've been talking to other people, it happens the same in Moodle, Blackboards and others. I mean, when you prepare like this kind of random assessment, you may get like peaks of uh, uh, load when they are starting, or you may even get bottlenecks when accessing the disk if you are running this kind of examination. So, in that case, we had to do something to avoid the current, the, the concurrent use 
of the exams. And basically I realized that, you know, even though we always complain when we are doing a management, that we don't have enough time to do research. And I had to take again my research hat and realize that I needed to solve a very difficult problem. And uh, basically uh, the problem was how with the restrictions that the, the different faculties had to uh, organize the exams according to some rules so that all the students can take the exams in, for all the subjects in which they've been enrolled. And at the same time, you have to minimize the maximum load. Well, this is not an easy problem. In fact, this is a big problem. And, uh, but we managed to apply some heuristic in order to assign to each of the different faculties which time frame for the, for the examination they had to take in order to make the process smooth. And in that regard, even we had to use some kind of uh, predictive model to estimate the number of students because in fact, we are talking, we're talking about the future. So uh, I don't know how many students are gonna be in each of the exams unless I can do a very good estimation. And this is something we also did uh, based on the type of subject, uh, with semester of the subjects, the number of people already passed, etc. So based on that, we were basically able to uh, minimize that peak, th those peaks. And in fact, we had like two critical days, 1st of June, 8th of June, in which uh, the peak basically was down from 8,000 to 1,600. And it was basically by being able to coordinate all the 26 faculties in our university on when they were starting their examinations for each of the subjects. Of course, this required a lot of collaborations from the different professors. I mean, if they are not respecting the, the, this assignment, then everything might fall. And I, I must uh, acknowledge that they took it really, really seriously. And in most of the cases, we have, we have seen that they've been really respecting what we did. And uh, we were very lucky that people took it seriously because if you look at this graph, we were concerned when we was, you know, in our record of eight, uh, 880,000 requests per day. But it was just the, the, the start of the iceberg. I mean, when we started with evaluation, and you can see the second peak on the first of June uh, uh, on the right side, I mean, this was, this was our um, record, but there was nothing compared to what came afterwards. I mean, we, we, we have an unprecedented use of all the platform. And in that day, we were uh, like many times the historical record. I mean, the, we, we, the historical record was about 400,000 requests a day. And that day we were nearly one and a half million. So how are we now? Uh, basically at the moment we are doing these examinations. Uh, in some of the days we have like 12,000 exams delivered at the same time and in the same day. And actually the curve resembles very well what we predicted. This is very good. And in, the, in fact, it has proven that we were uh, ahead of time. And in fact, our IT department is very happy because they know what's gonna happen before they start the, their day. We have already done like 86% of our exams. And as you can see here, the third number is the number of incidents we are having. By incidents, we mean uh, some teacher is asking some question on how to do something, uh, or even maybe some student had problems when delivering the exam and they had to be uh, uh, re uh, recovered. For instance, because they didn't submit the uh, push, they submit button on time and things like that. But it was very, very minor. And this is when you see that this pays off. I mean, you have more than 12,000 deliveries of exams one day, and you only had, and this is the day we had most incidents, 119, and many of them, you see six, two, five. This is something that we were able to, to manage. And in fact, also our prediction about the total number of the assigned uh, of a evaluations, it seems we're gonna be quite close because this week is basically the last one. 
And next Monday we had the last exam and it seems we're gonna be quite, quite, quite on target. So I'm gonna be quite fast with this one, which is basically the importance of providing the right support. I mean, we managed to uh, attend all the calls, we, we managed to attend all the requests, basically, at, in, in the same standards that we had before COVID. And it was very, very important. I mean, people felt that when they had a problem, they got solved in a matter of minutes. And this is very important when you are in, in, a, in a critical process like evaluation. I mean, when you are in some of the processes, you can wait a couple of days, but if you are in the middle of an exam, you need something really, really fast. And when we analyze the satisfaction, and I'm sorry, I didn't change this slide to English, and I'm sorry for that, but we analyze the satisfaction of people with the support they are getting, and in fact, again, we are in very, very good numbers. Uh, uh, we realize that this is a, a very important and the effort that people from the IT department has done is very, very good. But what do other people think about this? I mean, okay, probably the support is fine, the IT department is doing fine, but what do professors and students think about that? But, well, I think in this process of designing the how to evaluate, sometimes I feel, uh, I have felt myself like in this trying to find the equilibrium. I mean, you have professors on one side, they want to avoid people from, uh, you know, uh, cheating and all like that. But on the other side, you see students, they are confined at home, they are, com they, they, they are complaining that probably no, not in all cases, uh, they receive the lectures with the same quality they expected, and now you are evaluating me. So in that regard, I think the funny thing is that students were fighting quite a lot at the starting when we decided we were doing the evaluation uh, online, and they were completely against that. And now they are very, very happy because they see there's not been this big incidents. They are able to do that and, and they can do it from home. And probably it's the other way around with professors. That at the starting, they were uh, quite okay with doing the evaluation online. And now they realize that unless we are able to do some more strong proctoring, uh, probably uh, this solution is not good enough for them. So in that regard, and, and I'm finishing with this slide, uh, what I think is important is that we manage to learn from the experience and for that it's very important that we collect and get all the data of what's happening and take informed decisions. Mm, what we've seen is that expectation error has been growing time after time and our students are exposed to very good applications and experiences over there in what they expect the same for your university. And I think this is also another important it, uh, I don't know, we, we have to consider, and I think, I mean, we try to distinguish and make clear for people that what we were doing was not online learning. This was emergency, uh, 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 online teaching or calling, whatever you, whatever you want. But this is not really online learning in the sense that if I had to move to online, I would probably do things differently. But even in that situation, many people are complaining and trying to use that to defend their comfort zone. Like, you see, this was not very easy, it had problems. I think it's important that we're able to align what we do for next year to what is the overall university strategy for digital learning. Because otherwise, I mean, if for, if for next year we're trying uh, basically to go again for a minimum effort solution, probably that's not gonna be enough neither for students nor for uh, uh, the university, that's not going to be good. So in that sense, this is a summary of what we've done, what we've been doing, and I'm open for your discussion or questions you may have. Before finishing, I would just wanted to acknowledge that, of course, most of these things I have presented is work of a lot of people that they've been uh, working and doing their best to make the university continue their operation during this difficult situation. And of course, they are the really uh, uh, the, the, the one that is a recognition for this work. Thank you so much, Pedro. We have a few questions I ask people to, I mean, because we only have a few minutes left, I will try to read the questions. Uh, one of them from Bob 
has to do with the use of Moodle. Um, and now he has uh, Moodle versus Sakai advice on your professional experience. That was one of the first questions we received. Okay. Well, actually, I used both of them. Uh, in the university, we decided to move to Sakai 10 years ago. And this, at the start, it was like everyone complaining, you know, because, you know, the cultural change of changing the LMS is, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to handle. I mean, so uh, in my opinion, uh, they are pretty, pretty similar. And they are, uh, there's not this big differences between them. Uh, I see, in fact, that uh, the important thing more than the LMS itself is basically the content, the methodology, and how you use it. So in, in that regard, I don't think our teaching is going to be any better because we use Canvas, Moodle, or, or Sakai. In our case, we have an advantage. We are part of the steering committee of Sakai because we joined very early and we contribute code. So in, in some sense, that allows us to customize Sakai a little bit to our needs. But if you all don't have a, like a large IT crew, I mean, I'm devoting now 10 people to our MS, basically, and they are coding and changing things. You don't have such big uh, team for programmers and, 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 and doing that kind of adjustments. Uh, I would totally go for a standard solution uh, that is probably more used and easier to integrate when there are new tools. For instance, we are now, using some active learning tools that we are planning on integrating. Uh, in many cases, that's straightforward for standard LMS like Moodle, because you know there's a such a huge community of Moodle users over there that already the company is prepared for that. In our case, Sakai is not very well supported and we have to do much of the work. So in that regard, uh, I would probably in that case choose the other one. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ahmed Mohammed. Uh, what is the competitive advantage of distance learning for graduate and postgraduate students over business one? I'm not sure I understand. Um, Maybe it's a rotational one. Yeah, I wonder if Ahmed uh, would like to ask a question. We have another one uh, from mm -hmm. Jose Jimenez. What would you recommend in terms of estimating predicting systems demands? for smaller universities where their LMS is fairly recent, so they're not, there isn't enough data for modeling. All right, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a difficult question. I mean, most of these algorithms for prediction uh, are based on data. When you don't have the data, that's the, the difficult. What I would probably do is try to uh, run some small scale tests and try, to use that small scale information you get for uh, extrapolation in a, the larger scale. For instance, what we have done in our stress test was something like that. I mean, we started working with a single node and we extrapolated that uh, data to the rest of the 15 nodes servers that we had in different data centers. And that proved to be, to be quite correct in that aspect. But you, you have to make sure when you do your tests that they do really represent and can be extrapolated. In, not in all cases you can do that. In our case, what we did basically is we did it with two servers, we cut it to half, we realized that the data showed that actually there is a linear con, uh, relation between the number of servers and that particular data you want to predict, and so you can extrapolate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, we have one more question. Have you done any urgent changes in curriculum? What will be your advice here? Oh, uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, we didn't change that much curriculum, except in a few cases in which uh, we realized that there were some of the competencies that uh, couldn't be obtained remotely. I mean, uh, in, for most of our uh, uh, grades, it, uh, we have no big problem with that, but we have some special ones like veterinary, medicine, uh, nursing, I mean, uh, uh, physiotherapy. I mean, when you have to uh, realize and evaluate if a student's already got some competence in 
that areas, it's very difficult to do it online. So we, we will have to change a little bit these subjects to accommodate to the real situation and expect to be able to uh, complement that in the next course, right, next year. But um, that's been a minimum. Most of the people has maintained curriculum and they just changed the way we were doing, uh, they were doing the teaching and learning. Thank you. I mean, in the interest of time, I share a couple of links. The, the first one, and thank you so much, Pedro, for all of this knowledge. Uh, I feel like um, you answered some of the questions that I had even in early conversation before we started, which is what mm -hmm. considerations I think you have done a, an amazing job uh, gathering data and using data to inform your design. And we're hope um, that's, uh, that, that you're going to continue to do that so we can learn about what works and under what conditions. Um, I know that some of this have to do also with economic considerations, thinking about all of these changes in uh, you know, dropouts and also registration that uh, universities are facing all over the world. So thank you so much, everyone. Pedro, again, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. It was my pleasure.